Today we have a very exciting lineup of speakers, starting with uh, Dr. Krishna Milnatu. So Krishna is interested in understanding how brains generate adaptive behaviors, and to get these to get at these questions, his lab uses a variety of techniques, including genetic circuit tracing tools, physiology, and behavioral measurements. His current interests are uh, studying sleep in the fly Drosophila. His work speaks to two aspects of sleep, that sleep is plastic, that is modifiable by environmental changes and in turn supports brain plasticity and learning. So today he'll be speaking on neuroscience of sleep. Uh, Krishna is currently a scientist in the Department of Neuroscience, Washington University. He has obtained his PhD in 2008 from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and was a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institute of Health, Bethesda. Very recently, he has accepted an assistant professor position at Ashoka University, so congratulations on that. And with that, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, um, I'm, I'm assuming that's a yes. So thanks, Tanya and Ankush, and thank you for the invitation. Excited to, to talk to you today about the neuroscience of sleep. So uh, I actually just started a few weeks back at, at Ashoka. So I was at Washington University uh, before then. So some of the work I'll tell you about is work that was done at Washington University in St. Louis. But, um, yeah. Great. So I thought I'd start with a little brief introduction about sleep. It's a really exciting problem. We know so, so very little about it. Um, it's something we spend a lot of our time doing. So I'll start with a little brief introduction about human sleep. Okay. So, so how, how, you know, how, how do we tell sleep? Uh, seems like a kind of obvious question, uh, but you can look at behavior, for example. So here's the person in the bed, right? Uh, and you can, you can sort of tell when they're awake, they're kind of tossing and turning, moving around a bit, uh, maybe talking. Uh, but when you're, in, you're, you're, when you're in sleep, you, you, you can tell from, from their behavior that they're sleeping, right? But eyes are closed during non-REM sleep, you are twitching. In REM sleep, you have kind of complete muscle atonia, right? Um, but you can also look in the brain and see what happens in the brain when a person's sleeping. Um, okay, and so these are kind of uh, electrophysiological recordings. It's something called electroencephalogram, which I don't know if everybody's aware of what that is exactly, but it's, it's a way to put little uh, uh, electrodes in your scalp. And it, it's a kind of a measure of, uh, a gross measure of cortical activity, if you will. So when the person's awake, you have kind of a desynchronized pattern of activity. When they're sleeping, you get this more kind of uh, uh, what's called oscillatory pattern of activity, right? So you see you know, switching between an on state and off state. However, this is what is called non-REM sleep. However, during REM sleep, uh, it looks a lot like waking, right? The brain looks like it's awake. Um, but you have muscle atonia, so you're not acting out on what you're thinking. Okay, and this is again, just to say that you can also measure, for example, eye movements, so that when, when the person's in REM sleep, you have what are called rapid eye movements, and the electrooculogram down here shows you that the eyes are moving, moving uh, rapidly. Uh, and of course, REM sleep is, is, is a state of sleep that's most associated with dreaming. So that's a little brief introduction about human sleep, but sleep is not just a feature of humans or not even mainly a feature of humans. So about 20 years ago, so for most of you, 20 years may be a really long time, but in the history of science, it's really not that long. Um, 20 years ago, uh, the view of sleep was a very mammalian centric view, right? Mammals were known to sleep and birds were known to sleep and that was about it, right? Uh, so even other vertebrates, for example, reptiles, turtles, crocodiles, so on, uh, we didn't really know anything much about their sleep. But since in the last 20 years, it has changed dramatically, right? So we've gone from kind of two classes to this picture now that uh, sleep is pretty much universal in the animal kingdom, right? So almost all animals that have a nervous system sleep from uh, vertebrates up here all the way to the most recent entrant of club of animals that sleep uh, are these cnidaria, jellyfish and hydra, right? So almost all animals sleep. Uh, 
so so I thought I would show you some uh, examples. This is of an octopus, a very recent paper from just a few months back, showing different sleep stages in this octopus. This is so cool. So they actually change colors and you can actually tell from the color of the animal that the animal is sleeping, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, so this is a kind of REM sleep, like say, if you can see its eyes are open, kind of moving a little bit, like, cool. Okay, so all animals do it, pretty much. So you might ask, how can you tell whether an animal is sleeping? Okay, it's easy to tell when humans are sleeping, how do you tell when other animals are sleeping? Um, so I'll take questions at the end, and this is something really pressing, right? So the moderators can tell me there's something really pressing on stop, rather than something good. So how we define sleep, it's using behavioral criteria, right? So it's period of quiescence, animal has to be not moving for a period of time, it has to be rapidly reversible, so this distinguishes sleep from being in a coma or being paralyzed. Okay, this is a, thirdly, it's associated with what's called increased arousal thresholds, and it's actually a really important criterion. So this means, for example, that when the animal is asleep, you have to be harder to arouse. You have to stimulate the animal more, stimulate the animal harder in order to arouse the animal from sleep. So this distinguishes sleep from kind of quiet way, right? Sitting quietly and not moving. Final criteria is that it's homeostatically regulated. That means if you deprive the animal of sleep, you should see a rebound the next day. You sleep more, you sleep deeper, or both, right? Um, and of course, as, as Tanya mentioned, we work on sleep in flies and Drosophila, and this is how we measure it. We measure sleep using this uh, locomotor activity monitor. Um, and so we put flies individually in these tubes. Then we walk up and down the length of these tubes. And every time the fly crosses the beam, we get a little blip so we know the fly is active. Okay, and five minutes of inactivity is used as threshold for about sleep because uh, uh, work for a lot of foundational work in sleep and flies showed that the majority of flies that have been inactive for five minutes or more will show a change in a measurable and defined change in arousal threshold. So that means criteria for, for, for sleep, right? All right, okay, that's all fine, but what does it do? So this was a common idea in the field that sleep is off the brain, by the brain, for the brain. This is almost certainly not true. Uh, but it certainly does a lot of important things for the brain, okay? So one of those things is something called synaptic downscaling. And so um, this is an idea from uh, Kira Chirali and Juno uh, Most of you probably know what synapses are. And so the idea is that during wake, you're awake, you've been stimulated a lot, and your synapses get what are called potentiated. That means you get more synapses, stronger synapses during waking, uh, all over the brain, and then you downscale during sleep. Okay, so pair it back. Uh, and so this is kind of a, a picture from a fly, essentially showing that a fly that was sleep deprived uh, shows more branches in its neurons, right? So there's some, so, so some validity to, the, to this idea, um, but there's also numerous examples in the literature where uh, the opposite happens during sleep, right? You actually get more synapses, stronger synapses during sleep. So it's clearly not universally true, um, uh, although it is true on a kind of global scale. So moving on, here's another idea about what sleep is doing, which is uh, uh, based on a recent discovery from uh, Mike and Niedergaard's lab, or something which Mike can call the lymphatic system. This is in um, analogy to the lymphatic system, but except it's glia, right? So the idea the, is that in the brain, you have these glia which form uh, like pipes uh, that, that carry, uh, you know, toxic metabolites uh, out of the brain, okay? Um, all right. And so, and, and this is this has been shown in, this was shown very recently in 2013 or something. Um, and, and the system actually expands during sleep. So you get more clearance during sleep than during waking, right? And this was very recently shown to be true in flies as well. So again, again, the reason I'm bringing up all these examples from invertebrates is to say that Sleep is a universal phenomenon or near universal phenomenon. So if you want to think about what sleep is doing, you kind of have to look more broadly right, at, at, at life more broadly. Um, but the, the, the idea about what sleep is doing that I, I really want to focus on for this talk is about memory. Okay. So the idea that sleep promotes memory is just hardly revolutionary today. Most people accept it as common knowledge, but it was not always the case. This idea really took, took flight in the field after, the, after this classic experiment and the discovery of what was called hippocampal place cell replay by Wilson McNaughton and colleagues. 
Um, and so what they did in this classic experiment was to train this rat to run along this linear track. So it's protracted along this along this track. The track the rat will run very reliably along this track. Um, and what they found was that the trajectory of the rat along this track was represented in the brain as a pattern of activation of what are called place cells in the portion of the rat's brain called the hippocampus. And these are color coded here. And the cool result they found was that when the rat was asleep, the sequence was then replayed, kind of fast forward replayed. The reason this experiment was so revolutionary is because it really reinforced this idea that sleep is actually an active process, right? So sleep is, so the, if you were to think about why this is insightful, you might consider the alternative, which is that, for example, you form memories during waking, and then over time, memories will just normally be great, right? But if you shut the brain down in sleep, you can slow or delay this process. Uh, so that's a kind of more passive role for sleep. But this experiment really elegantly showed that that was not true, something we'd known before anyways, but they re reinforced this idea that sleep is actively promoting the right? um, sort of just prevention of passive degradation. Okay, uh, rats are all very nice. What about humans? So it turns out a uh, class of memories that are particularly sensitive to sleep loss in humans are this class of memories called declarative memories. Okay, these are memories of kind of episodes in your life, memories of facts, words, those sorts of things. Um, these are also not very strongly encoded, and that's probably the reason why they're also labeled and labeled to degradation with, with sleep loss, with aging, and so on and so forth. Okay, but you can imagine it's kind of hard to study, get at mechanisms in humans. Um, so instead, what we do is we study spatial learning as a model for declarative memories, because in short, the spatial learning is essentially a kind of evolutionary precursor for declarative memories in humans. Okay, so how do we study spatial learning? This is classically studied using this assay called the Morris Water Maze, named for its discoverer, Richard Morris. Um, and so this is actually a, a, a big tank, uh, you know, the size of half, half a room, probably, uh, filled with this kind of opaque liquid. And you dump the rat in in a corner, uh, and the rat is swimming around like crazy, trying to, trying to not drown. But this, fortunately for the rat, this submerged platform. And so the rat has to find that submerged platform, so it swims around trying to find it. Um, but there are these visual cues which will guide the rat there. So you, you know, over several trials, you've kind of trained the rat. You can move the cues, move the platform, so on. So the rat eventually learns, oh, hey, I can use these visual cues to find this platform. And so it goes pretty fast and goes straight there. Right? Great. So that's kind of what you see here. The rat over several trials gets faster. And if you lesion the hippocampus, uh, you know, you kind of break this process. Okay. Okay, but of course we studied flies, and so so we uh, adapted a version of uh, a spatial learning assay in flies that was first developed by Michael Weiser and Frederick Merry. So this is a, essentially is a heat maze instead of a water maze, a thermal maze, right? So you have a Peltier plate, a grid of about five by five grid of tiles which are kept hot. And then you have this glass plate on top to prevent the flies from flying away. Um, but one of these tiles can be cool, okay? So the fly doesn't know which one. So this is something like your submerged platform for the rat, right? And then you have these visual cues. So you move the visual cues, you move this cool spot, and eventually the fly learns to find the cool spot using the visual cues, right? So it gets faster, kind of like what we saw with the rat. Right, this is just to say that we can replicate it. That's good. Um, the kind of interesting thing that I found that I, the, the part that I, I thought was really interesting was that was when we started looking at kind of aged flies, we found that First of all, age flies sleep a bit less. This has been seen before, and it's similar to what's seen in humans and rats and other animals. Um, but what we found that was kind of exciting was that these age flies uh, pretty much stop learning, right? So this is a pretty sensitive assay for age-dependent decline. These flies are about three weeks, three weeks old. Um, and what was really exciting was we could take these age flies that are learning impaired and then improve their sleep. So you enhance their sleep, they sleep more, they sleep deeper for a couple of days and they're able to restore learning. Right? So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, and we can enhance sleep in a couple of different ways. So, that, so this tells you that it's not a it's not, uh, side effect of the way you enhance sleep. It's really sleep because we can do it in a couple of different ways and see the same, same result. Right? So, so this is kind of exciting because it suggests that uh, sleep is not just enhancing memory in a healthy brain, not just consolidating a memory in a healthy brain, but it's able to actually restore plasticity to a brain that's impaired. Okay, so that, that's pretty cool. Um, all right, 
So I'm just going to switch tacks now and tell you quickly um, about a slightly different area. So we're going to come back to this idea that sleep is basically universal. But if you look across the animal kingdom, you find um, that there's great diversity in the kind of sleep behavior, right? So sleep is evolved to be plastic. Right? It's not a glitch in the system, it's not a bug in the system. It's really the way the system is designed. So sleep evolved to be plastic, to be modifiable in response to kind of environmental challenges as well as uh, ecological niches that animals happen to be in. So I thought I'll give you a little example, few examples of that. So he, here's a really cool study from Ed Dubois and Alex Keel looking at these amazing cave fish. So these are really cool fish that live in the, in the, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so th there are different uh, kind of strains, if you will, of these fish. They're the cave fish that actually live in the caves. These have lost eyes, they're blind. Uh, and then the, there's the surface dwelling cave fish. Uh, you know, of course, not really cave fish, but whatever. Surface dwelling forms, if you will, right, which have eyes. When you look at their sleep, you find that the ones that actually live in the caves, the blind ones, uh, sleep very little, right? And this is thought to be an evolutionary adaptation because it allows the animal to forage, right? So if you're, if you're blind, you can't really find the food, you want to spend all your time trying to forage, trying to find food. Um, great. But these animals are able to do fine despite sleeping very little. It's something to keep in mind. It's not just foraging. So here's an example of one of these birds called pectoral sandpipers. This is a very nice study from Niels Rattenborg. These are birds that have this kind of long and very elaborate mating season. So during this mating season, a lot of time mating, a lot of time fighting, uh, like males will fight each other, competition with females in territory, and very little time sleeping. Okay. And interestingly, what they found was that the, the, the birds that actually slept the least sired the most offspring. Okay. So that's pretty surprising because you think sleep is so critical for fitness and so on. Um, it's not just mating and foraging. So here, here's an example uh, of some animals with pretty big brains, the dolphins. So dolphins in general do this kind of unihemispheric sleep thing, which is, which is pretty cool in itself. Uh, but in this study from Jerry Siegel, uh, what they found was that uh, these, these dolphins, right at the time they give birth, both the mother dolphin and the calf pretty much don't sleep at all for seven weeks. Okay, up to three weeks with zero sleep, and apparently they do just fine. They don't show rebound, right? And they have great memories and so on. Um, so this is again pretty surprising because you think, you know, you have, uh, pretty much all animals from flies to humans sleep a lot in the early, in kind of early life, right? And that sleep is really critical for plasticity and so on. But here these animals are basically not sleeping at all at this very young age, um, and they seem to be doing great. So that, that's pretty amazing. Um, finally, we have some land animals, elephants. Uh, and so in this study, they looked at these elephants when they were migrating from one site to another. Um, and what they found was that, again, these elephants during this migratory season, they pretty much don't sleep at all for a couple of days. They don't seem to recover the sleep. They don't seem to show any cognitive losses for it. Okay, that's, that's all pretty amazing. Um, okay, but so the last category of kind of ecological factors I want to talk a little bit about is predator prey relationships. And so here's, here's an example of these, these rats. These are Norwegian rats. They're, of course, normally nocturnal. Um, but when you put them on a the midden where they could be under risk of predation by these foxes, which are also nocturnal, they completely switch. So now they become diurnal. They're active during the day, they're actually sleeping at night when the predator is active. Okay. So this is pretty, pretty surprising because you think, oh, you're, you're sleeping, you're kind of vulnerable to predation and so on. Um, but these animals are actually choosing to sleep at a time when the predator is active. Okay. Uh, and they're doing that, of course, because more, many animals tend to sleep in a safe place. So these rats, for example, will sleep in a burrow on the ground, hole on the ground, so you're away from kind of predation. So. Okay, so all these examples together, taken together to put forth this idea that sleep evolved uh, to be a state of what is called adaptive inactivity, okay? or more compounds to sleep to stay out of harm's way. Um, and so this is kind of uh, typically thought to be about the timing of behavior, as you do behavior at times of day that are appropriate, but we think it also has a kind of adaptive role so that it helps the animal adapt to this kind of normal situation. And um, I can maybe at this time, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we might address that. Okay. Okay. So we want to see if there was something to this idea to sleep in the out of harm's way. And so we thought pretty much a fly that cannot fly, presumably cannot escape out of harm's way. So there's something to this idea, maybe it'll change sleep. Right? So here's one way of, of of impairing flight, just to cut the wings. Uh, indeed, we find that if you, if 
compared to flies with intact wings. When you cut the wings, they sleep more. Okay, in this paper, we did about eight different ways of impairing sleep. So I won't show you all of them. This is just one way. They all increase sleep. So cutting wings increases sleep. And we were able to localize the effects to a very specific set of uh, neurons in the fly's wing. Um, that was cool. Um, so if you impair, if you inhibit these neurons, you can block the effect of um, uh, cutting wings on sleep, okay? All right, but still something's missing because these are just neurons. I'm just checking the time. I think I have about 10 minutes, right? Okay, we'll keep going. All right. Um, okay, so these are, these are neurons that come in from the fly's wing, but there still has to be something that relays this information into the brain. What's that missing piece, right? How do we find it? So we use this tool. It's a nice circuit tracing tool. I won't go into the details, but it's just a way to kind of label neurons that are one synapse downstream of the neurons we care about. It's a really neat tool. Uh, and so we use that in the sensory neurons. And we were able to find neurons that were one synapse downstream. Interestingly, these are these are amazing, project, beautiful projection neurons. They connect the, the, the fly's wing, which comes into this, this part of the, the fly nervous system called the ventral nerve cord into, into the brain. Okay, so these are the kind of long range neurons that are gorgeous to look at. Um, okay, it's very pretty to look at them, but we also want to understand how these neurons are modified. Uh, and so we have ways of, of, of doing that. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to go into details, but this is just a tool called Kalexa. It allows you to, to translate neural activity into expression of GFP. So more GFP means the neuron is more active. And we find that when you disrupt flight, these neurons are more active. And again, just to show off the range of tools that are available in flies, uh, we next wanted to see, you know, if, if, if these neurons are structurally changed by flight disruption. And so we can do that using a tool that labels presynaptic sites. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, indeed, we find that if you disrupt flight, you, you, you cause structural changes in these neurons. And this is a way for, for uh, uh, these phenotypes to manifest for, for a length of time. So for example, you can disrupt flight and you still see changes in sleep for days. And this is because these neurons are structurally changed by that manipulation. Okay, so to quickly summarize, this kind of, kind of surprising relationship between flight and sleep, between flight and increased sleep. This ties into this old idea about adaptive inactivity, which uh, didn't have kind of observational support, but didn't really have any mechanistic understanding. Uh, and if I know neural mechanism, parts of the brain that nobody suspected being involved in sleep regulation before, that's cool. Uh, and it's kind of a mission statement for me. Uh, in thinking about science is uh, if you want to think about if you want to think about the brain, if you want to think about neuroscience, behavior is a good place to start. And it's important to take kind of evolutionary perspective because human brains are part of civilization. And I will say in terms of a, a clinical perspective, we're in the middle of what's been called a sleep loss epidemic, uh, but there are many you know, reasons for this. And you can imagine that finding circuits that are recruited to regulate sleep under certain circumstances has clinical implications because you can imagine that if these circuits are activated or, or inhibited at inopportune times, uh, you get into trouble. Okay, and so I'm gonna stop and skip this part uh, and just quickly acknowledge and say most of this work was done in Paul Shaw's lab in the Department of Science for you. I have to really thank Paul for the, for the freedom to pursue a project that was kind of offbeat. Um, there's people for reagents and advice. Um, Bruno and Leonie helped me a little bit of the space learning stuff, doing some control experiments. Michael gave us some useful technical advice. Uh, and I just started a show for three weeks back. We're hiring. That's my website. Get in touch if you want to. Right, let's talk. Thanks. Mm -hmm.